tonight on NJTV News. After two prior vetoes, a new pension funding plan is signed into law. Is the third time the charm, or could the funds still come up short? Taking the long view amid huge medical center mergers, a small hospital holds out. What do they know that the big guys don't? Younger patients are more prone to becoming addicted to painkillers. Would a new bill that changes the way they're prescribed prevent addiction? Remember that saying, when the going gets tough, the tough goes shopping? Turns out retail therapy may not always reduce stress. But toys always work. We look at classics made in Jersey, left in the dust by technology, but still on sparkling display. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Manufacturers, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. The public worker pension funds headed back into black. Or is it? The new law establishes quarterly payments, but there's no way to stop officials from skipping them if the state comes up short. Brenda Flanagan reports. Powerful people. They got a lot of people's lives in their hands. Retiree Shepard Benyard harbors few illusions about his public pension. He knows the $73 billion funds teetering on the brink of insolvency. It's $44 billion in debt. And years of union protests and lawsuits still have not persuaded state lawmakers or the governor to fully fund it. As for Governor Christie signing a new law now requiring quarterly payments into the pension fund. Christie said some time ago that he was going to fund it. He never did. Now they're going to fund it quarterly. We'll see. Yeah. Let's wait and see. That's all we can do. We are hopeful and that this leads us into that, uh, you know, to that culture of making our payments. Speaker Vincent Prieto supports the new law because it's been too easy for politicians to raid that big year-end payment and stiff the pension. If something happens, that's the low-hanging fruit that normally is taken and not paid, and that's what had been happening through many, many years. So instead of one lump payment at the end of each fiscal year, June 30th, the new law calls for smaller payments made at the end of each quarter, September 30th, December 31st, March 31st, and June 30th. Jersey will start budgeting under the new law starting with the new fiscal year, July 1st. So the first quarterly payment will come due at the end of next September. But critics claim the law can't compel payments or amounts. It's like the effect of a recommendation. Without the constitutional amendment requiring payments, you could be getting quarterly payments of nothing. There isn't a hard obligation uh, in every budget cycle to make a contribution. And so it becomes uh, subject to the kind of negotiations we see going on right now in the legislature. Financial analyst John Burry says the fund needs serious reform, not this. It's internal manipulation and, you know, it's deck chairs on the Titanic. I mean, this is going under and you really got to go into the engine room and, you know, fix that or get another boat because defined benefits run by governments just don't work. New Jersey's unfunded pension liability helped drag the state's credit rating down for the 10th time under Governor Christie, but a constitutional amendment to mandate pension payments could backfire, says Assemblywoman Holly Shapizzi. God forbid we had had some sort of emergent situation, another Hurricane Sandy, something like that. There would have been no flexibility within the state to ensure that, you know, emergency type of situations were taken care of. They're not worried. They're going to get there. They got pension. They got health care. They got all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. We out here struggling. Here's the bottom line. The pension crisis is still a crisis. The new law can encourage the state to make the payments, but it can't make them do it. In the newsroom, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. A This Old House house tour. That tops the nice Garden State Express. Our first stop, Greenwich Township, where 30 years after Henry Hudson blew in and claimed this land for the Netherlands, the Finns sailed in and constructed Nothnagel Cabin as a butcher shop and dairy barn. That was 1640. 
before the first official European settlement. A decade later in 1650, some Swedes built a granary in Hopewell Township. In 1670, a farmhouse sprung up in Pennsville called Obisquahasset, Lenape for muddy waters. Ben Franklin is said to have purchased gingerbread at a 1685 vintage Revel House in Burlington. Ladd's Castle in West Deptford was built in 1688 by the surveyor who helped William Penn map out Philadelphia. There's Cox Hall Cottage and the Jonathan Pine House in Cape May, Camden's Joseph Cooper House, and the Andrews Bartlett Homestead in Tuckerton, all constructed in the 17th century, still standing. They don't build them like they used to. Next to Long Branch, where a car registered to the boss is going for, well, a little more than a song on eBay, Bruce Springsteen says in 1975, he paid a cool $2,000 for his very first car. A 57 Chevy Bel Air convertible with dual four barrel carbs, a hearst on the floor, and orange flames spread across the hood. But a year later, he swapped it for a 1960 Corvette because the Chevy was too showy. The Chevy comes with the original vehicle registration, a temporary insurance card, the Allstate insurance card issued in Springsteen's name and address, and an 80-page book out in the street, Bruce Springsteen's 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air convertible. It sold five years ago for $468,000. The current bidding is over $300,000. You've got a few more days to place your bid. Finally, Warren Township, where this one's too little to ride. Michelangelo is one of several miniature horses from a therapeutic riding center in Chester called Hope's Promise. He's no one-trick pony. He's actually not a pony at all, but he can walk up and down stairs, ride in elevators, and even visit people in their bedrooms in nursing homes or classrooms, like the Mount Horeb School, where preschoolers discovered he's more Goldilocks than Michelangelo. Not too big, not too small, but just right. And that's the Garden State Express for Friday, December 16th. Something up in your town? Tip us off. We are coming to the end of what's been, for many people, a very stressful year, spurring a Rutgers researcher to actually study how humans handle stress. Do we save or splurge? Turns out retail therapy may be a myth. Michael Hill reports. Kids, work, it's a little bit of everything. That's what Ingrid Fontes stresses about. How do you handle that? Uh, yeah, I shop <laughs> quite a bit. But what Fontes buys and why were the subjects of Rutgers Business School's Christina Durante study in conjunction with the University of Miami recently published in the Journal of Marketing Research. I noticed that sometimes when I myself was feeling stressed, I would sometimes want to eat a tub of ice cream or go out and do retail therapy and spend my money. Other times when I was stressed, I noticed that I couldn't eat, I didn't have an appetite, and I just wanted to be isolated and conserve resources. That's what piqued Professor Durante's interest. The researchers spent two years testing the behavior of 700 participants. So what we did was we had people engage in the most stress-inducing event in life next to death, which is giving a speech in front of a room full of people. Then the researchers tested the participants to see how they would spend or save their money under acute stress. So generally stress does lead to saving money. The professor says what we buy when we're feeling that kind of stress depends on one word, control. Whether or not people saved their money and spent on necessities or did more of the retail therapy where I'm just going to spend to feel good hinged on their perceived level of control over the stressful event. Ingrid Fontes seems to prove the theory. Do you feel you have control of that, that stress or, or, or is it something that you feel you don't have control of? No, I know where it's, you know, where the line it's cut, so I just do a little shopping and then I feel all better. So what do you buy? Um, it depends. Makeup, you know, a little shirt, pair of pants, always a little something different, something for the kids. And what does that do for your stress? 
I get over it. <laughs> the professor says predictability is the big issue. So when things are unpredictable, we don't know what the next day or the next hour or the next minute may bring. So we have to go into deep survival mode. Professor Durante says life throws us many reasons to stress, traffic, weather, the recent presidential election, and more. She says the research proves it causes us to conserve and it's information important to marketers and consumers. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Now to New Jersey's business, standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda, homeownership's in for a rough holiday, huh? Yeah, Mary Alice, some rather discouraging news really for both homeowners and renters. New Jersey continues to lead the country in foreclosures, even as the national foreclosure rate is showing a dramatic decrease. There were nearly 6,000 foreclosures last month, or one in every 600 homes. Atlantic City and Trenton recorded the largest foreclosure rates, according to RealtyTrack. Meantime, home construction tumbled across the country last month. Construction of houses and apartments declined nearly 19 percent, according to the Commerce Department. Now, economists say housing inventory is already in short supply, and they're hoping this is just a temporary blip. Meantime, another report on inflation today showed rents keep going up. They've surged nearly 4 percent in the past year. That is the biggest 12-month gain since 2008. Income inequality is getting worse in New Jersey. The Garden State has the seventh highest income gap between the richest and poorest residents, according to a report by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and the Economic Policy Institute. That is worse than it was four years ago. Wages have barely risen for middle and lower income workers. Meantime, the top 5 percent of New Jersey households made an average of more than $400,000 in 2015. There's been a rush of people seeking to enroll in Obamacare, prompting the government to extend the deadline to midnight Monday the 19th. Coverage for those who enroll by then will begin on January 1st. As of next week, Mylan's generic version of its EpiPen will be available in pharmacies. The generic version will cost $300 for a two-pack, half the cost of the brand name treatment. Mylan in many ways became the poster child for soaring drug costs earlier this year. On Wall Street, stocks closed out the last trading day of the week with losses. And those are today's top business stories. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The state's health care landscape has been redrawn by a rash of hospital mergers, acquisitions, and affiliations, resulting in far-reaching medical centers providing a wide range of care. But there are holdouts, hospitals choosing to remain independent. Aaron Delmore reports. We're not the largest. We're not in a system. Uh, we are innovative. We are creative. We are financially sound. Uh, and we provide outstanding care. Michael Marin is president and CEO of Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, one of a shrinking number of New Jersey hospitals that's resisted pressure to merge with larger organizations. Do we really want to go down to this two, three provider system, one, two major payer system? and that's it and we think that's in everybody's best interest or do we want to have a competitive marketplace there are around 75 total hospital facilities in new jersey a decade ago nearly all were independent but that's changing as facilities are chasing economies of scale in greater numbers they can negotiate higher payouts from insurance companies how has holy name resisted it's challenging right and i wish i could say with a hundred percent confidence we'll be able to continue do we compromise our values just to keep the lights on or do we figure out ways and take with the pressure to make sure that we do it the way that we want? And if at some point in time we can't, then we're going to be faced with the decision of saying we either merge into somebody or we turn the lights out. 
Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck is one of only 11 independent hospitals in New Jersey. Trinitas Regional Medical Center is also independent. Its Vice President of Marketing and Public Relations tells us Trinitas is always evaluating the healthcare environment and considering the best way to deliver care to our patients. That includes affiliations with larger institutions like St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center in behavioral health, with JFK Medical Center in stroke treatment, and with Newark Beth Israel Medical Center in pediatrics. The New Jersey the Department of Health tells NJTV News high-level care requires significant investments. Quote, mergers are one approach for making these significant investments while achieving the economies that scale provides. But are the financial benefits passed on to the consumer? A national report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation found hospital consolidation generally results in higher prices. When hospitals merge in already concentrated markets, the price increase can be dramatic, often exceeding 20 percent. The underlying drive force was leverage, market leverage to negotiate rates. Marin says the Affordable Care Act changed the landscape for health care providers, especially when it comes to Medicaid expansion. He worries the state, with its budget woes and continuous downgrades, will lower the eligibility threshold once federal incentives run out, leaving many without insurance wherever they go for care. In Teaneck, Erin Delmore, NJTV News. The state's opioid addiction toll on young people is staggering. Last year, 1,587 people died of overdoses. The Governor's Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse reported some 4,200 people under age 25 were admitted to substance abuse treatment programs in 2012, and those addicted to prescription painkillers dwarfed the number addicted to heroin, hallucinogens, and cocaine combined. Lawmakers are considering requiring doctors and dentists to discuss the dangers and alternatives to opioid-based painkillers before prescribing them to young people. The executive director of the Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey is Angela Valenti. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Are young people under the age of 25 more susceptible to addiction, and would this bill address that? Well, I think that we know that the brain is still developing until a person is well into their early 20s. So when you put in an opiate into that system, there's certainly grave concerns that it will lead to addiction. We've also found out through our research is that children who are prescribed opiates, painkillers, prior to high school graduation are 30 percent more likely to become heroin addicts as a result of that. This bill would require doctors to talk to minors and their parents about this and offer alternatives. That's are correct. there alternatives? Uh, absolutely. There are many alternatives that are available that are being used currently in emergency rooms and in doctor's offices. But what this bill does is makes it uniform so that every doctor and every emergency room doctor as well as every dentist in the state will have an opportunity to speak to the parents of a child, a teenager, prior to prescribing. Share with them the fact that the, the drugs that are being prescribed can become addictive. Mm -hmm. And also talk to them about alternatives that are non-addictive alternatives. Are doctors aware of the risks themselves? Uh, I think that they're learning. I think that for many years uh, there was a misunderstanding on the part of the medical community about these, these particular drugs, these uh, opiate-based drugs. Uh, for many years they thought that they were safe and they really didn't have the consequences or the addictive qualities that they have. And we've learned that they are extremely addictive and that in many cases, too many cases, when a person, especially a young person, is given these prescriptions, it leads them down a path of addiction. Now, an earlier version of this bill would have um, it required doctors to talk to all patients right. about the dangers of opioid-based prescriptions and, and offer them alternatives. Does this bill go far enough? Well, I think it's a great first step, and it helps protect those people that we think need to be protected the most, which are our children. But certainly, we would encourage, and not only that we encourage, but the Surgeon General and the Center for Disease Control have recently come up with guidelines that encourage doctors to speak to all patients, no matter what age they are, about how dangerous these medications could be. And also, they need to be looking at prescribing on a very limited basis, if they needed to be prescribed at all. Well, that's interesting. This this bill also doesn't uh, limit the, the number right. of painkillers that can be prescribed to a single patient. Why? Well, I think there are other bills that are, that are being heard that talk about limiting uh, prescriptions. Uh, this bill basically is an education bill. It provides education to families, to children, to, to, their, to their parents or guardians, and it really gets them engaged, which is important. 
Is there a possibility that you are uh, deciding that a law is going to take over a doctor's regime? Well, I think that this bill does not do that. This, what this bill does is it really provides an opportunity for doctors, patients, and families to understand and to become aware of the consequences. We did a survey recently in New Jersey, and it showed that 30 percent of middle school family, middle school parents, did not know that there was a link between prescription drugs and heroin abuse. So that means that a third of parents that are taking their children into emergency rooms for broken limbs, for sports injuries, or to a dentist's office for a wisdom tooth extraction, they don't understand that these drugs can lead to addiction. Okay, thank you very much, Angela Overline. Thank you. The race to succeed Governor Christie is gaining speed. On the Democratic side, the candidate with the current advantage heading into the 2017 primary is wealthy and well-connected former ambassador Phil Murphy. One of his challengers is liberal Bernie Sanders backer Assemblyman John Wisniewski, who's facing an uphill climb. During a taping of On the Record, David Cruz asked him whether the race is a battle between Wall Street and Main Street. Wall Street's not bad. There are many wonderful people who work there. But the problem is, is when you bring in that philosophy to run state government, you know, Wall Street looks as, at people as liabilities. They look at roadways as assets, and they want to cut the liabilities and sell the assets because that's the way you think on the street. Well, that's not good thinking for running a state like New Jersey. It's a lot more complicated than that. And what New Jersey needs is a leader who understands that, not somebody who wants to come in and bring a boardroom mentality to running state government. I think I hear a lot of Republicans right now saying, oh, here comes some big spending Democrat when you talk about not running government like a business. No, oh, no, no. You can't come in and make it a merger and acquisition where we're going to lop people off, we're going to sell the assets and try to improve the bottom line. Government exists for one particular purpose to help people. It provides a function that private industry can't provide. It provides services that no one else will provide. And so government has a responsibility and obligation to the people of the state of New Jersey who have nowhere else to turn. And so we can't tell those people who are looking for a $15 an hour minimum wage, who are looking, women who want to get paid equal amounts of money that, for the same work that a man does, Young men and women coming out of school, we can't tell them, look, it's not our responsibility. I'll go to the private sector. Government has a fundamental mission to accomplish. And when you look at the kind of thinking that Wall Street brings, you see one that is totally antithetical to helping the men and women of the state of New Jersey. We see a middle class that's under assault. That's not going to get better by bringing in more Wall Street thinking to the governor's office, because we did it once before, David, and it didn't work out well for New Jersey. You can watch David's entire interview Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and again Sunday morning at 10. We leave you with a holiday flashback to a golden age when a tenth of all the toys made in America were stamped made in New Jersey. Here's Maddie Orton with NJ Arts. Boy, wants a Renko toy. And so do girls. Way before Hatchimals and Tickle Me Elmo, New Jersey was one of the top five states for toy production. Since the 1960s, those companies have nearly disappeared, but not without leaving their mark on the industry. These innovations are a big focus of Toy World, an exhibit now on display at the New Jersey State Museum. Curator Nicholas Chautala. The earliest toys are from the turn of the 20th century, like Thomas Edison's talking doll that he created in the 1880s. In the post-World War II period, you see this transition from toys made of wood and metal into modern-day plastics. That innovation happened right here in New Jersey. Nearly 200 toys from over 50 companies like J. Chain & Company, Remco, and Lionel Electric Trains are on display. 
The toys were pulled from the museum's permanent collection and acquired through auctions, eBay, and loans. Looking at the colorful tin and small pieces, perhaps the most obvious difference between then and now is how far safety measures have come. And so it was a steam engine, a live steam engine, which you would fill the tank with ethanol or alcohol. You would light it on fire <laughs> with, in a wick and it would boil water in a boiler, which would then produce steam and power the train forward. Chautala also compiled 30 minutes worth of New Jersey toy commercials from the 50s and 60s to add context to the playthings. The, the exhibit really looks at toys, but toys are the medium in which we explore aspects of American history and aspects of New Jersey history. Yes, with Susie Homemaker you can entertain, wash dishes, clean house, launder, iron, bake all this and always look Lovely. Interestingly, the name Susie Homemaker in that time, 1960s, think about what's going on. There's pushback from the feminist movement against this toy. This is the world of busy girls. You can't play with the antique toys, but the exhibit is still interactive. There are Legos, building blocks, and a place to post memories of your favorite childhood toy. Some of the toys will no doubt be familiar. Characters like the Lone Ranger, Dick Tracy, Lil Abner, and Popeye make appearances. And some will leave you scratching your head. Before George Washington Bridge traffic was all the rage, the fun-filled game of Lincoln Tunnel traffic. In Trenton, I'm Maddie Orton, NJTV News. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. Happy weekend. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future, and New Jersey Education Association.